ECC registered versus ECC unbuffered. I would like to build a storage server based on new slash Linux or Freebst, which will be on all the time. To prevent data corruption, which is unlikely to happen as I never had such a problem, but better be safe than sorry, I would like to use ECC RAM. Although not as good as ED, which is way more expensive and provides additional protection. ECC seems to correct only single bits errors. ECC registered RAM is only usable with workstation, server boards such as Intel Xeon or AMD Interlago slash MagniCore slash Valencia G34 or C32. ECC unbuffered is usable on Intel Xeon V 1155 or AMD M3 Plus on ASUS boards. The second option will be way much cheaper on the processor and motherboard side, and I doubt I will need more than 16 GB of RAM, 4x4 GB ECC and buffered are the largest affordable sticks. The doubt I'm having is, mainly concerning ASUS M3 Plus board, is ECC unbuffered RAM as good as ECC registered RAM, from the point of view of safety and reliability? Or is it a worse choice? I don't care much for the speed. More details, server will use a server case with up to 24 by 3.5 inches drives and should consume as little as possible. OCA 1155 seems to be in that sense a better bet, TDP 20 to 95 watts, versus the others, and GT, 80 watts, for twice the price. Any suggestion is welcome. Let's say less than 120W at idle, tilde with 10 hard disks out of 24. ECC seems to correct only single bits errors. Correct. To correct more errors would require more bits. As it is, you already use 10 bits to store 8 bits of information, wasting 20% of the memory chips to allow to a single bit correction and up to 2 bits of error detection. It works as follows. Imagine a 0 or an 1. If I read either then I just have to hope I read the right thing. If a 0 got flipped to a 1 by some cosmic radiation or by a bad chip then I will never know. In the past we tried to solve that with parity. Parity was adding a ninth bit per 8 bit stored. We checked how many zeros and how many 1 were in the byte. The ninth was set to make that an even number. For even parity, if you ever read a byte and the number was wrong, then you knew something was wrong. You do not know which bit was wrong though. ECC expanded on that. It uses 10 bits and a complex algorithm to discover when a single bit has flipped. It also knows what the original value was. A very simple way to explain how it does that would be this. Replace all zeros with 000. Replace all ones with 111. Now you can read six combinations. 000, 001, 010, 100, 101, 111. We are never 100% sure what was originally stored. If we read 000 then that might have been just the 000 which we were expecting, or all three bits might have flipped. The latter is very unlikely. Bits do not randomly flip, though it does happen. Let's say that happens 1 in 10 times for some easy calculations, reality is much less. That works out for the following chances of reading the correct value. ECC registered RAM is only usable with workstation, server boards ECC unbuffered is usable on Intel Xeon or 1155 or AMD M3 Plus on ASUS boards. I already mentioned what the ECC part was, now the registered versus unbuffered part. In modern CPUs the memory controller is on the CPU die, starting long ago for AMD Opteron chips and with the Core i series for Intel. Most desktop CPUs then talk directly to the DIMM sockets holding the RAM. It works and no extra logic is needed. That is cheap to build, and the speed is high because there's no delay going from the memory controller to the RAM.
but a memory controller can only drive a limited current at high speeds. This means that there is a limit to how many memory sockets can be added to a motherboard. And to make it more complex, to how much the DIMMs can use, which leads to memory ranks. I will skip that since this is already long. On server boards you often want to use more memory than a desktop system. Therefore a register buffer is added to the memory. Reads from the chips on the DIMM first get copied to this buffer. A clock cycle later this buffer connects to the memory controller to transfer the data. This buffer slash register delays things, making memory slower. That is undesirable and thus it is only used slash needed on boards that have a lot of memory banks. Most consumer boards do not need this, and most consumer CPUs do not support it. Directly connected, unbuffered RAM versus buffered slash registered RAM isn't a case where one is better or worse than the other. They just have different trade-offs in terms of how many memory slots you can have. Registered RAM allows more RAM at the cost of some speed, and possibly expense. In most cases where you need as much memory as possible, that extra memory more than compensates for the RAM running at a slightly slower speed. The doubt I'm having is, mainly concerning ASUS AM3 Plus board. Is ECC unbuffered RAM as good as ECC registered RAM, from the point of view of safety and reliability? Or is it a worse choice? I don't care much for the speed. From the standpoint of safety and stability, ECC unbuffered and ECC registered are the same. More details. Server will use a server case with up to 24x3.5 drives and should consume as little as possible. 24 drives are going to consume a lot of power. How much depends on the drives? My 140GB 15K RPM SAS drive is drawing a mere 10 watt at idle, same as the 1TB SATA 7K2 disk. At use both draw more. Multiply that by 24. 24 by 10 watt at idle means 240 watts just keeping the disk's platters spinning, overcoming air resistance. Double ish there for in use. Although 1155 seems to be in that sense a better bet, TDP 20 to 95 watts, versus the others, and GT, 80 watts, for twice the price. Intel is better at low power CPUs, at the time of writing and for the CPUs you mentioned. Any suggestion is welcome. Let's say less than 120W at idle, tilde with 10 hard disks out of 24. If you go for freezed, look hard at ZFS. It can be great. Many of its more advanced features, for example deduplication and or compression, use serious CPU power, and want plenty of memory. ZFS for basic use with ZRAID will do fine on both CPU sets you mentioned and with 16 GB, but if you turn on features like deduplication you should look carefully into the recommended memory needed for your disk capacity. Up to 5 GB per TB of storage is recommended by some guides. Two more things. I did not see anything about connecting the drives. Some boards may go up to 10 SATA ports. But for anything over that, you will need add-in cards. If you consider hardware RAID then it might be best to plan that from the beginning. Drive failure. Should you use SATA port multipliers then look carefully how they act if a SATA drive fails. It often is not pretty. Not a big problem for a home setup, but very much not enterprise grade. You may need to consider how individual drives handle errors too. The reason some drives are labeled as being for NAS or RAID use is that they handle errors differently than regular drives. With no RAID, you want the drive to retry as many times as possible. With RAID, you want the drive to fail quickly, so you can read from another copy. Two separate issues. ECC versus non-ECC. Use ECC wherever uptime is important. Costs more, need, multiples of, 9 chips instead of 8. Motherboard must support it to use it. Registered versus unbuffered. Can have, much, more total RAM installed with registered DIMMs. Less electrical strain on the memory controller interface. 
but all DIMMs installed must be registered or not. Must remove unbuffered DIMMs if upgrading to registered. Also is more expensive, and a cycle slower to access. Unbuffered is slightly lower latency, if that matters. All random accesses take many cycles anyway. Note absolute access latency, time in nanoseconds, hasn't improved much over history of DRAM use in PCs. Cost, capacity and bandwidth vastly improved instead. Memory caches hides the latency for most memory accesses anyway. Longer latency hurts single-thread real-time performance most. Usually doesn't affect server use cases much. No slash minimal difference in bandwidth and overall performance. Sequential access bandwidth unaffected. L2 slash L3 caches mean actual access patterns mostly replace rows at a time in the cache, so are usually burst accesses anyway. If you want to support the channel, please consider subscribing.